coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. America's cattle ranchers are proud stewards of our natural resources and the livestock in their care. We're talking with some of these hardworking members of the beef industry about the challenges they face while growing a climate for tomorrow. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. We're celebrating National Ag Day, which offers us a chance to say thanks to the farmers and ranchers that provide food, feed, and fiber for the world, all while preserving and protecting the resources in their care. We're on location in Texas to highlight what it takes to raise cattle and deliver high quality beef in an ever-changing regulatory and social environment. We asked some of the ranchers and cattle industry stakeholders from today's program to tell us about the pride they feel in being part of America's food production system. I'm proud of being a part of the food production system in the U.S. because Middle America provides so much for this country in terms of food production. And it's just a really rewarding career to, uh, to put a safe, wholesome, delicious product on the shelf for the consumer. I'm proud to be a part of the U.S. food production for several reasons. Um, the, biggest, the biggest one would be that it, it's, it's a source of, of fulfillment to know what we're doing and the product that we're creating that's going to wind up on someone's plate and they're going to enjoy that meal. You know, we really love what we do every day. You know, we, we get up with a passion for taking care of the land and the cattle and uh, that seems to never go away. But um, we've been doing it quite a while now. We've been on this ranch about 45 years. So just to be able to supply beef all around the world is uh, quite, quite a humbling experience. We'll hear more from those folks throughout the show. But first, let's toss it over to Kate Maher, who's at the 77 Ranch near Dallas-Fort Worth. Kate? Thanks, Kevin. I'm here now with Gary Price of the 77 Ranch. Gary, can you tell us a little bit about your family's ranch? You bet. Um, we bought the ranch, the first part of the ranch, back in uh, 1976. Um, got an opportunity to buy 272 acres from an old friend of mine named Lee Lowe. And I uh, first met Lee when I was eight years old. And uh, the opportunity came up, so we bought the 272 acres. It's a family operation. Our son uh, runs a ranch north of uh, Fort Worth now, and he'll come back someday. Cow-calf operation. And um, a lot of the ranch was in cotton many years ago, so we've gone in and reseeded a lot of those old cotton fields but uh, we're re really fortunate we've got uh, part of the old native grass prairie, the uh, Blackland Prairie ecoregion that was never plowed. So that's very important to us. And uh, we rotate two herds of cattle through about 2,500 acres. We're located about 50 miles due south of Dallas. So uh, we've got some pressures there, you know, from the development in that area. But uh, we uh, background all of our calves and uh, we'll put some value added claims on those cattle, and then they'll usually go to Nebraska or either, either to the uh, Panhandle in West Texas. Well, thanks for having us out to this beautiful location today. You mentioned being very close to Dallas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. What are some of those pressures on your land that you're seeing from being so close? Sure, um, the Metroplex continues to grow. As I said, 7.2 million people in that area. So 50 miles, those folks can, can actually commute and uh, build homes around us. So a lot of pressure with development, with land being chopped up into uh, small 10-acre tracks. And um, you don't have folks always on the same page. We actually have 52 neighbors now that join the ranch. Also, there's a lot of interest now in uh, renewable energy. So we've had literally 14 companies from around the world contact us about a renewable energy project, whether it be wind or solar. So <clears throat> we're, we're not completely uh, in uh, perfect decision of what we're gonna do, but we're probably looking at a conservation easement as uh, really fits, fits our 
family and, and the plan that we want to go. It's interesting the pressures that change, um, you know, from, from residential to energy. It's just interesting how those pressures have changed. You're also a past winner of the Environmental Stewardship Award program. What opportunities has that provided you and your ranch? Yeah, I just can't tell you how many doors have been opened, you know, since uh, that award in 2012. And the ranch was really uh, fortunate to receive that. And it's a very humbling experience to do that with so many great past winners. But um, since then, I mean, we, we do uh, a lot of interviews, a lot of um, printed material, you know, will be asking to do an interview and did one a couple of days ago with Hereford World. But um, just to be able to work with those different folks that have won the regional winners and learn from them. And then we host a lot of tours on the ranch as well. And um, that's very rewarding. And there's a lot to learn from everybody. Uh, you never really conquer this and you never should stop learning. So uh, it's opened a lot of doors for us and we're very thankful for that. You get to teach and learn, uh, learn about different techniques. That's fantastic. Yeah. You also have a very interesting relationship with McDonald's and you're part of their flagship farmer program. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you got started? Yeah, that's uh, one of our great uh, prides, you know, to be able to work with McDonald's. Um, we received the award in 2018 and have worked, it's hard to believe it's been five years, but been working with them. They've actually uh, had their senior leadership team to the ranch two different times and this past fall they were here and uh, may be hosting them again in uh, this spring in April. But it's just been great to work with them and understand their side of the business. We visited their headquarters in Chicago. And then, of course, when they're here on the ranch, the questions that they have about the ranch and how we take care of cattle and, and ranching operation, all the things about water, uh, biodiversity, all the, the topics that are key now, you know, with climate issues, carbon issues, then it's been great to be able to work with them. Um, can't say enough about their team and their willingness to learn about the ranch. And um, of course, again, it works both ways and learning their business and the challenges they have. And, and uh, we need to mesh those together. We need them. You know, they're one of the largest buyers of beef in the country. And um, <clears throat> they actually hosted us in um, Orlando at their biannual convention and uh, had over 12,000 people at that convention and was able to speak at that convention and that was very rewarding as well. Meet all kinds of their franchise owners from all over the world and uh, we came away from there with a much better understanding of their side of the business. And again, we, we need them and they need us, so it's a great relationship. You gotta have somewhere to send that, that beef to yeah. um, that you work so hard to produce. Um, as that partnership's evolved, what opportunities do you see in the future uh, for both you and, and McDonald's um, and customers of McDonald's? Well, as you know, I mean, climate is, is the issue. We, we think now there are a lot of companies that are like food companies especially that are looking at carbon issues and, and trying to be carbon neutral and re reduce their carbon footprint. So it's a great opportunity that we're, these companies and, and consumers as well are looking at the land and how we raise and produce beef. So with that in mind, I mean, how could you have a better partner than McDonald's to be able to help send that message? And um, they have crazy capability, you know, of marketing and be able to touch that consumer that we don't have. So a great relationship there. Um, it's not just about carbon, we know, it's about water issues and when we're taking care of the land and we're growing a lot of grass and we're doing it correctly, it's not just carbon sequestration, which is a big thing, but it's also how water infiltration takes place, how we have cleaner streams. And if you look at the lake we've got here, it was built in the late 50s. There are fish are jumping as we're speaking here today. So clean water. When we have fishermen down here that are catching big bass out of here, they tell us, you know, that this water is so clear they can't believe it. But when you, grass is probably the best filter you could have. So working with them has been outstanding and we think the relationship will be continuing and we look forward to that. Yeah, very important. Uh, as we celebrate Ag Day to, uh, today um, and all that goes into producing beef and then all that goes into to selling beef to consumers, whether it be McDonald's or some other outlet, why is it so important for, for anybody that touches that product to connect with consumers about beef production? 
just very important that the consumers understand, as I said, they're more there's more interest now in where your food comes from and how it's being produced and then the impact that production system might have on the the environment the land so we have a great story to tell beef producers across this country are doing great work taking care of the land taking care of the cattle we just need to tell that story and get it out and um, mcdonald's has been a great partner to be able to help do that but the consumer we like to be transparent. When those cattle leave here, our brand is on there. Um, our reputation goes with those cattle all the way until it's consumed. So we, we want to be completely transparent with all that we do with those cattle and how we're taking care of the land. We like to say we have open gates and we have many tours out here. So anybody from any organization is welcome here and see what we're doing and, and uh, we enjoy showing them around. Gary, thank you uh, for sharing your story with us today and for all you do, most importantly, uh, to get that beef, um, beef to consumers. You're doing a great job. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Well, appreciate NCBA and Cattlemen to Cattlemen. A great way you can support your fellow cattle producers and yourself is by becoming a member. It's easy to do. Just call 866-233-3872 or visit the website ncba.org. Still ahead on this special Ag Day edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll talk with another award-winning Texas producer who is managing his ranch in an economically and environmentally sustainable manner. Stay with us. Matt Makins here in this week's Weather Watch. We're chatting about water, the Colorado River Basin, the Missouri Basin. What's the spring flooding outlook risk look like? That's what we're talking about in this week's Weather Watch. There's never a dull moment for the Nelsons. Fifth generation Montana ranchers. Since 1868, they've been herding cattle, reeling in trout, and exploring Paradise Valley from their backyard. Here's to another 150 years of adventure. Here's a story in every piece of land. Run with us on a John Deere Gator XUV and start telling yours. Cattle producers across the country work hard to care for their animals and their land. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is there to help. Find out how you can work with NRCS to develop a conservation plan for your operation. Find possible funding resources for implementing conservation practices or get free expert advice on ways to improve your farm or ranch. Visit the website nrcs.usda.gov today. Welcome back. America's cattle producers have worked for generations to protect the land, water, and air resources in their care. Let's check in again with Kate Maher, who's with a Texas rancher who's facing challenges while providing the best possible care for his land and his livestock. We're here in North Central Texas on the historic J.A. Ranch with Ruder Bright. Ruder, this ranch has been in your family for a very long time. Can you give us a little history of the place, please? Well, my grandfather put this ranch together starting in 1929, and it's, it's composed of several different properties. And up until 01, everything that was part of this ranch was all foreclosures and bankruptcies. So you can imagine it probably didn't come to us under the best of conditions. The, it'd been grossly overgrazed. And even even people that thought they were doing a good job, they didn't do a good job because they didn't know to do a good job. Uh, the science behind grazing management and land management is advan and still advancing. What we know today probably is gonna look pretty foolish 50 years from now or 100 years. I hope it looks foolish. I hope we really make some strides, but, but that's where we are right now and kind of learn some lessons along the way, right? A lot so, of lessons. We hope we don't forget. Right, right. So maybe talk a little bit about the management practices. How are you How are you taking care of the natural resources um, on your ranch as you put this together? Well, we've gone from historically set stock rate. Each pasture had a stocking rate and the cattle were in that pasture year round and never varied. Uh, if you got real dry, may back off a little bit. If it's a good year, you might add a little bit, but not very much. But starting at about two to three weeks from now, we'll start consolidating herds of cattle and we'll have them down to about two herds. 
and we'll start moving cattle about every two days. And the faster the grass grows, faster we move them. It starts to slow down, then we'll go to moving about once a week. And then we start calving, we disperse, and we'll move cattle out into 10 or 12 different pastures, sometimes 14 different pastures. And they'll sit in those pastures for about 60 days at a time as we calve out. So it's really working the cattle and the lands together then? They have to, they have to work together. Uh, speaking of that, you've been very involved in the Grazing Lands Coalition. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about that and why work um, that that coalition does is so important to yourself and, and other ranchers? Well, what we're trying to do with it is, is show people how with good management, they can lower their costs, they can lower their labor requirements and, and give them more security on into the future. It, it, it is so simple. We have not had the success that we should have had, but we're constantly trying to get that message out. And we want to get it out through any avenue possible. Cattleman, Cattleman's wonderful. Uh, noble research is great. Natural resource conservation is great. But we just, it takes a personal effort with one person work with another person. Money to do projects doesn't solve it. It's intelligence transferring that that science-based intelligence to those producers. So they're all trying to do a good job. Nobody is ever going to intentionally destroy their property, but they make mistakes because they just, sometimes it's a very subtle little adjustment, but they fail to, to recognize that on a timely basis and things start rolling downhill. Grass grows grass. And if we, the more grass we produce, the more security we have and the less problems we can encounter as we move forward. You can't talk about grazing and cattle without talking about water. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about what you think about the waters of the U.S. rule um, and how that could impact the work that, that you do on your ranch and even in the grazing coalition? Well, I, I think waters of the U.S. is an absolute grab of, again, people that are so far removed, they think they can fix something. The only way we fix it is right here on my land with me taking care of it, and when I see a need that I'm able to act on it and, and take the action that I need to take at that point, if I have to go through a bureaucracy, it's absolutely a disaster. You know, there's an old saying that when everyone owns it, it's cared for as if no one owns it. And look at the federal lands and the gross mismanagement that happens on those lands. And that's not to mean that within those agencies there are not some great individuals, but when you disperse it, it's, it's an absolute wreck. And, and we've got a hundred years of proving it. It's not something's questionable. So when we talk about sustainability, which is a big topic for, for our industry and, and all industries, why is sustainability so important to your ranch and to the beef industry as a whole? Well, sustainability goes back to, that, to meeting the individual needs at the in a timely manner as you need to do it. When, if the weather, if we get a little more rainfall, and the grass gets ahead of us, we can stock a little heavier. And we, we run transects on this ranch every year. It shows us a trend line. And as, as our grass density improves and the percentage of the higher quality plants improve, then we know that we can up our stocking rate a little bit. But if we see that trend line starting to go down, then we know that we need to back off and change what we're doing a little bit. And all this is subtle. And that's what we're seeing. And every time we go through a drought, the drought of the 30s, the drought of the 50s, drought of 11, people that don't make the adjustments, we're seeing a continued degradation of the productivity of that land. It's not coming back. Now, it doesn't mean it can't come back, but you're extended the period of time and the resources required to bring it back. So timeliness is everything of grazing land management. Sure, and taking that information um, and using it to be able to manage through those droughts and, and, and unpredictable conditions is a big part of sustainability. Ruder, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having us out here at your beautiful ranch. We really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming out. Thank you. When we come back, we'll move from the cow-calf world to the cattle feeding sector as we discuss some of the issues facing feed yard operators in Texas. Stay with us, we'll be right back. We're always concerned about worker safety when we're dealing with livestock and farming or ranching environments. There's a lot of things and a lot of hazards that can happen. 
One thing we really are concerned about in any kind of sustainability model is the, the people side of that equation as well. And so if we can really keep our workers safe by training them appropriately, not putting them in a situation that is dangerous, it improves the sustainability of the operation by keeping those employees and retention of employees. Because people like to work where they feel safe and they feel appreciated. Proper training, good equipment, a good plan is always something that makes somebody feel better about the day. BQA, the right way is the only way. The Beef Quality Assurance Program is funded by the Beef Checkoff. If you're looking for the best in cattle industry news, information, and education, then don't miss NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Each week we cover important topics such as herd health and cattle handling, plus updates with congressional and industry leaders about today's top policy issues, and stories shot on location at cattle farms and ranches around the country. Don't miss NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD-TV and on YouTube. Time now for Weather Watch, brought to you by Ag Risk Advisors and WSR Insurance. Time for a Weather Watch. Matt Bacon's here. I hope it finds you doing well. We haven't touched much on the water supply or the flooding issues, so let's do that in this week's Weather Watch. Rivers, reservoirs, in many cases for the West, a much better situation than last year. And we'll break down the West first, and then for the upper Midwest, kind of more similar to last year to lower than last year. But this is the snowpack that's currently on the ground. Clearly we have quite a bit across the, the Northern Plains, the upper Midwest, New England states, and a lot out to the West. And a lot of cases for the Sierra Range, I zoomed that snowpack map in, the Sierra Range, the Wasatch, and the Rockies of Colorado. In a lot of cases here, we have near record amounts of water waiting to be melted in the form of that snowpack. It's been quite a remarkable snow season for those areas. What does that do? in terms of the reservoir storage. Well, obviously we haven't melted it much yet. For example, Lake Powell, Lake Mead, they're still very short. Uh, Blue Mace is only 37% of normal, but we're gonna be adding quite a bit of water to these reservoirs as we go into the melt season, later spring into early summer. And what does that look like? Well, if you look at those basins that contribute to the Colorado River, we don't do the Sierras, they don't contribute to the Colorado, but looking at the basins that contribute to the Colorado River, we're looking at greater than 200% of normal runoff into those reservoirs. It's gonna take a lot more than that to fill them up, but this year the snowpack has been tremendous and this will be helping, at least somewhat, the water issues for the West. Let's take a look at Montana through the upper plains, the northern plains there of the Dakotas and the upper Midwest. Snow on the ground, it's been a very snowy winter. Soil moisture still struggling a bit until we begin to melt this off but coming with that melt may be the risk of flooding. And no, it's not gonna be like the 2011 flood. So if you look at the Missouri River Basin, this was 2011 and that flow was tremendous. 2011 was, was notable, obviously. Where do we sit ranking near that? Well, here's 2023, this red line, and the forecast does come up a bit for July and August, but nowhere near 2011. In fact, we're just shy, kind of a shadow, if you will, of last year. Now that's not to say there won't be flooding, and here's the flooding risk outlook. Obviously gonna have to watch out for the Sierras and parts of California, don't get me wrong. But it's the upper Midwest, the Northern Plains here that may have some moderate to major flooding from the Missouri flowing into the Mississippi. Something to watch out for this spring. That's this week's Weather Watch. I'm Matt Makins, blessings to you and yours. Weather Watch is brought to you by Ag Risk Advisors, with you no matter the weather and by WSR Insurance, providing insurance solutions for more than a century. Visit their websites for more details. We're back on this special Ag Day edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen, where we're talking with members of the beef industry about the challenges they face while growing a climate for tomorrow. We're coming to you today from the northwest corner of the Texas Panhandle here at Besner Beef. And Michael Besner is our host for today. Thank you so much for opening your operation to us. Tell us a little bit about yourself and Besner Beef. Well, our feed yard is a family owned feed yard and uh, we have a capacity of about 20,000 head. 
uh, we farm and ranch as well as that. I have two younger brothers that are involved in the operation and my dad is still involved. I have a brother Mitchell and my dad Jody that take care of the farming side of our business and then a younger brother Stephen that takes care of the feed yard with me. Uh, my dad moved up here in the mid 60s when he got out of college, uh, left the Hereford area and that was when pivot irrigation was just coming into this part of the world. And uh, we uh, always had a cow-calf herd along with our farming and row crops and uh, stocker and backgrounding operation. And then in 1997, we decided that we'd diversify a little farther and add a commercial feed yard. And uh, that's where we're at. We're blessed with a fantastic group of employees that uh, help us take care of the farm and the, and the feed yard and also blessed with the wide array of customers scattered all across the country. Thanks for having us today, we appreciate that. And also with us is Gene Lowry from XIT Feeders, also here in the Panhandle. Tell us a little bit about your outfit. I work, I manage uh, XIT Feeders, which is owned by Five Rivers Cattle Feeding. And uh, we're one of 13 feed yards that the company owns. And uh, we're located southwest of Dalhart. And uh, I grew up in southwest Alabama on a cow-calf ranch and uh, went to school at Oklahoma State and went to work for Continental Grain in 1994 and been in the Panhandle ever since. That's fantastic. You know, as we celebrate Ag Day, one of the things that consumers want to know is, what are some of the things that you all are doing every day to manage the, the health of, of the cattle in your care and under your care? Tell us uh, what goes on here at Besner Beef. Well, we're, we have a beef quality assurance program uh -huh. that uh, we, in cooperation with Texas Cattle Feeders, association helps us take care of and it really starts day one for the cattle as new arrivals or day one for a new employee mm -hmm. is to make sure that we focus on everything that we can do to make the time that these animals are here at the yard as conducive to them being in good health and good condition which also relates to efficiency for the feed yard and the customer feeding those cattle. So it's to everyone's benefit to take as good a care of them as we can. Gene, what would you add? We also have the same beef quality assurance programs at XIT. And along with that, we have a team of consulting nutritionists, consulting vets that monitor our programs and uh, help us train our employees and make sure that we're following the programs that they have outlined. You know, uh, one of the common themes across all the beef cattle industry has been this ongoing drought, and we're right in the heart of it here in the High Plains. I'm curious to know what impact has drought had on your operation, Gene? Drought has had a big impact on our, on our ability to procure feedstuffs. That's, that's been the biggest thing. Uh, the droughts brought cattle to us sooner, feeder cattle to us sooner than what normally would be the case. But the big impact here in the last year and a half has been uh, ability to procure roughage, and, and I think that's going to continue. Um, the, the cattle, uh, the shortness and the cattle herd and those things I think will continue to show up. Uh, it's probably going to be more e exaggerated in the year to come. Yeah. Michael? I would concur. It is, uh, this drought, it's been tough on the land and been tough on the people here too. Mm -hmm. uh, and our, you know, it's increased it's increased prices on all of these feed ingredients, but especially roughage and their availability. And what do you see it doing to the long-term placements here in this feed yard as we think about the consequences of a smaller cow herd? Well, I can tell you today that we're getting these cattle in lighter and lighter, and that's okay. a function of the pastures playing out because of the drought. Yeah. Wheat pasture not being available because yeah. of the drought. We just continue as an average in weight and age, these cattle are younger than they normally are. You both mentioned the great teams of people that you've assembled to help you manage operations of this size. Let's talk a little bit about labor. And I'm curious, I mean, are you finding any technology that can supplement your labor needs? Because it is getting harder and more expensive to find people to help operate feed yards, Gene. Yeah, it's uh, labor is a big issue, a big concern for us. Um, as far as technology, the companies use, use the drone uh -huh. for some inventory management purposes. Okay. Um, also, they've we've demoed some uh, driverless uh, wheel loaders. Really? Haven't put that into place in production yet, but we have demoed it. And I, I really think that's a big opportunity for the industry in the future. That's phenomenal. Michael, do you see technology playing a role in your operation long term? 
Absolutely. It's distant, you know, in the last, in the 25 years that we've had this yard here, or about that, 26, I guess now, um, we've had changes, you know, across the whole yard, whether it be computerized batching at the mill, mm -hmm. whether it be GPS controlled feed trucks yep. that keep us from mainly take a lot of errors out of, you know, <laughs> okay. we can use a less qualified feed truck driver sure. and still do as good a job or better even. Lots of opportunities in our industry for sure. You, you talk a lot about the environment and sustainability and of course part of that is is your role in, in being a good community member. There are some people that that uh, look at large scale operations like that with uh, like you all run with disdain. I'm curious what are you doing to be a good community member and to minimize and manage the negative environmental impact that, that some people think of when they think of large animal feeding operations well it's it's important to be a good neighbor I feel like in any any business but it's especially here because all of my neighbors are my customers you yeah. know I'm buying feed ingredients from them okay. so it's important to keep a good relationship my family has been active for decades with the 4-H community and the FFA community here. We're big believers in those programs and have always supported them and happy to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, lately, we've been uh, supporters of the Snack Pack for Kids program, oh, which uh, is for uh, grade school kids yeah. to make sure that one, they have enough nutrition yes. and two, that have enough protein with yes. them. So. That's phenomenal. I love programs like that. And it's given people an introduction to beef as well. Gene, how we, about you all? What I tell everybody usually, it's, it's pretty simple. That we, we live in these communities too, and, uh -huh. and we raise our families here. Yeah. And we're gonna do everything that within absolutely within our power to, to keep things like they need to be. We're, we're also uh, involved with the 4-H we do a lot of things with uh, with the feed yard technician program that Texas Cattle Feeders offers. You know, as we celebrate National Ag Day, I'm just curious. Uh, we're talking to people from each one of the segments in the beef industry and from the feed yard segment. I would like you to tell us what what do you want consumers to know, Gene, about what you're doing here in feeding uh, cattle. We uh, we we work. Our industry works tirelessly to provide a safe, wholesome tasty product mm -hmm. and we take it very seriously and uh, we're going to do everything in our power to continue to do that. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. I, I love production ag and I like growing things. I love uh, feeding these cattle and putting a product at the at, end product for the consumer at the grocery store at mm -hmm. the restaurant that they can count on and depend on and know that they can trust it and that it's safe. No doubt there's uh, not a shortage of challenges in this business, but it's uh, reassuring having guys like you and the team behind you that are caring for these animals and putting that product on the plank. Thanks for joining us and thank you for having us here at your feed yard, Mike. You bet. Thank you. Enjoy thank you. it. Still to come, you'll meet a Texas rancher who's reaching consumers through a butcher shop and restaurant. That story when we return. Stay with us. that certain time in the day when you can take a deep breath knowing your work is done. That's the feeling Aspen products can create. Cost-effective alternatives to name brands that deliver the same results. Quillaxin is one of them. Use it to prevent and treat respiratory disease in your herd. Then breathe easy. Find them at Animal Health International. This beef quality assurance tip is funded by the Beef Checkoff. Hi, Jolie Fitzsimons here to talk to you today about the Beef Quality Assurance Program and our online BQA modules. The BQA program is an important part of the beef industry. It helps to build consumer confidence and ensures that we're taking care of our animals the right way. The online modules are a great way for producers to stay up to date on their knowledge and certifications. We have three courses, cow-calf, Stalker Backgrounder, and Feed Yard. All three of these courses are also available in Spanish. They're free online and take about two to three hours to complete. If you don't have that time, the great thing about the modules is that you can come back to them later as it saves your progress. Our states also host in-person trainings. You can find more about these in-person trainings and our online modules at bqa.org. 
The Beef Quality Assurance Program is funded by the Beef Checkoff. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the oldest cattle industry organization, working every day to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen and policy updates from Beltway Beef, plus big discounts from John Deere, Cabela's, and more great partners. Join now. Call 866-233-3872 or sign up online at ncba.org. Welcome back. Over the past several years, many cattle producers have captured additional value by selling their beef directly to consumers. Here's Kate Maher with one Texas rancher who's taken the idea of ranch gate to consumer plate to a whole new level. And we're here in Fort Worth, Texas now, at a local butcher shop that's creating a lot of waves in the community. We're talking with Don Ray, one of the owners of the Meat Board. Don, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here and thanks for letting us be here with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and this awesome shop. First of all, it's our pleasure and my pleasure to have you guys here. I think you actually brought more customers in here today than we've had in the, but no, thank you. Uh, this idea kind of evolved around my friend, Nick Nicholson, Dr. Nicholson and I, both Aggies, been partners and friends for a long time, talked about this concept and we kind of got rolling with it with the, in the 2018 and, uh, and it kind of went from there. And we got to 2020 and said, okay, let's make this concept work, so. You know, uh, A&M has turned out a lot of great people that have done great things in the meat world. So to, how did you get the idea to do a butcher shop and, and serve lunch? It's, a, it's been a hot spot today for lunch, for sure. That's an interesting question. I'd never had a retail store before, and, uh, <clears throat> but I'd been all through the gamut of starting out in a processing plant out of A&M and all the way 40 years later, 50 years later, through cook process, ready to eat product. product. But there, there just didn't seem to be a, a place in Fort Worth, uh, or many places in Fort Worth that had a, a butcher shop where you could go in and, and say, I want that steak or I want you to cut one thicker for me. Plenty of places to buy steak, but not th th with that touch that I felt like we could do by putting together a team that could talk, talk meat, talk beef. Then we got into the thought of now we have this kitchen and we have this product coming in here. Let's just make it out of the stuff we have here. We can control it and showcase beef items. And like the number one selling sandwich we have is a, a tenderloin sandwich. And uh, so that's how it really got rolling. And it just has taken legs. And we decided, you know, probably that's one of the better marketing decisions we ever made. Because we got people coming in here that say, I've never been here. I heard about your hamburger or your tenderloin sandwich or your hot dog and we'll be back to buy steaks. And it, it's kind of, wow, we're on the right track. Yeah, and you're, serv you're serving them the quality product that the, you're selling them to take home. That's fantastic. Absolutely, they yeah. can get the same thing they just had in that meal right over here, or right over here somewhere. Don, you're also doing a lot of fun things here at the shop to sort of bring the ranching world to your customers, whether they're having lunch or buying out of the meat case. Tell us a little bit about that. That's, that's interesting. You know, we, we developed the logo where it looked like a brand, kind of simple, um, and, and we, decided to do the ear tag thing uh, because people, we hang them on these little holders and we encourage people to take them home, make a keychain out of it. But it just tied in with what they see on that wall in there, that they see a brand, they see an ear tag and, and they go, wow, these are, these are just like the, and I said, exactly, I use them every year, you know, when I re-tag. Um, you know, we have a great partnership with the Cattle Raisers Association. I've been, been a member of the Cattle Raisers for 50 years. Uh, and they're so supportive and they've helped us get out in the industry here also. And they're Fort Worth based. What's unique about what we've tried to do here in Fort Worth with this butcher shop, as I might've said earlier, we're in, a, in a, an affluent part of Fort Worth and there's a reason for that. There's plenty of parking, we got a thing, but people want to come in and buy a good piece of beef and, and we can teach them through that. Secondly, uh, is we're setting in Cowtown, Fort Worth is Cowtown and uh, there's no reason not to have a successful butcher shop in the cow town. And the stockyards are re being revived again. So it's all really headed down the road of eat more beef. Cow towns are cool once again, aren't they? They are, the cow town is ready to roll. Yeah. So in addition to, to good lunch and good beef to take home to, to cook, what else are you offering your customers here and what's been the response from the community? Well, as far as 
the good burgers and whatever. I think the, the thing we offer here is there's a selection. If, if I'm, and, and they can come in and say, tell me about what you have here. And, uh, and we get in, it, we're able to tell a story because we have the personnel that are here, these, these young guys that are, that are educated in the meat side of it. And, and we begin to explain to them, this is prime product, it's aged. What does that mean? Well, we put four weeks on it, five weeks on it. We have choice. What does that mean? It's upper two thirds. So we can get into that, that, that a lot of places don't do that. And I always tell people, if you, you've, you've come to the right spot, because we can certainly tell you more about meat than you'll want to know. Well, you've got a smooth operation here for sure. What were some of the challenges that you faced though, kind of getting up and going in the direct to consumer sphere? Well, ironically, the biggest challenge is timing. We opened this store J January of 2020. Uh, we were about to launch a pretty heavy marketing campaign in March, April, May, and June. We had a great month and a so of anybody that was anybody was coming to see the meat board. And we thought, wow, this is gonna be great. We'll launch this, COVID hits, and everything just obviously shut down like it did everywhere. So we're like, okay, what do we do now? And we decided to, since we couldn't do lunches, we, people really don't know we're a butcher shop yet. Yeah, the, so we moved a lot of the furniture out of here and started putting stuff that was hard to get to some c consumers, to paper towels and hamburger buns and that kind of stuff here um, to get them in and they would heard about it, just word of mouth come in to get that product. You go, oh my gosh, you're a butcher shop. I'll just pick up some ground beef to go with these buns I just got. So, it, it, I mean, we didn't have a line out the door by any stretch, but it was comforting to know that we had some traffic when it was a scary time of everybody's life. At that yeah, um, just like any sector uh, along the beef supply chain, you had to be flexible and yeah. it sounds like you were. That's right, yeah. 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 No, we, yeah. Um, how does operating the meat board um, then really help you connect with your customers and tell your ranching story? Because I know you have cattle too. Yes. Fortunately, I've spent 30 something years playing with genetics and because I always wanted to raise something I wanted to eat. And, and, and the grading system has changed so much since 1965 when I went into A&M. Uh, for instance, back then, the industry average on prime was less than 2%. Today, it's probably 10 or 12%. So we've, the beef industry has come a long way, improving the quality out there. But uh, we wanted to try to take that and take it to an another level, but from the teaching aspect of it. And you've been kind of doing direct to consumer before it was cool. I know you've been doing this a long time. What would be your advice to somebody um, that, that maybe is looking to um, do direct to consumer uh, beef sales as a marketing option? Well, if they're going to do a butcher shop, that type of direct sales, you know, you know, it's it's pay attention to quality, and try to offer something that's not just everywhere. That it's unique and and special things. Like if people want other products in the beef industry, we can get that overnight and brought into here. And the other is if you're going to go into the, to the uh, offering hind quarters, four quarters, or half of beef out in the industry. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, pay attention to quality. But, but some of the challenges there are that if you sell that product to a c consumer, you probably won't see them again for six months or eight months. We felt like what we're doing here, we, we could connect either weekly or bi-monthly. People come in here every week or every other week at least, or at once, and, and we could keep them interested in what we're doing and, and supply them with what they're after. Um, you know, you made a really great point about you wanted to raise what you, what you wanted to eat. And I think that's evident in the meat case, but consumers can also come in here and in your shop, you have some scenes from your ranch in here. Um, does that kind of connect the cattle to the quality of the product? Well, it does because when they walk in, when we when, when I design this place, the, the interior decorator, I tell this story in this boardroom, we call it, uh, we glass that off because we had too much space, we thought. So we'll do the butcher shop here, funnel people here, and then we're gonna open this, or have a mead board, we call it, and uh, or the boardroom, excuse me, um, that we can offer different things like charcuterie classes. Uh, we do steak 101 classes with these guys teaching how to how to keep a knife sharp and how to trim a piece of meat that you buy at a store or buy here. Um, we do brisket trimming classes because it's big and it's grilling months where these guys get out and to grill a brisket and they but they buy one and they need to trim it down and how to season it, whatever. That's been very beneficial in there. But then the people see, they come in, they see this mural, because this, this interior decorator, as I was gonna point out, said, I want you to make a statement on that wall in there. And I go, well, I'll, I'll just get a picture of a really nice Angus cow or whatever and put on there a cow calf. And she said, no, I'm talking floor to ceiling, wall to wall. So we took some drone shots of cattle at the ranch 
brought them, blew that one up, and not thinking, other than the fact it looks pretty cool, but not thinking it would have any kind of impact other than people go, well, wow, they just perceive that we'd walk in and you guys are ranchers because you didn't have that painted on there because you just liked it, but it was part of the ranching operation. And, um, uh, and, and some of it eventually and has come through here. So we could say we're, we're, we're committed both from that ranch to what you're getting across the, the counter here to make sure it's what it should be. Yeah, and it puts a really nice story in their mind. Don, yeah, yeah. thank you for letting us be here at the meat board today. Um, it's, thank you for all you do to bring great quality beef to consumers here in Fort Worth. And now I'm gonna go shop the meat case. Well, I'm passionate about that. You guys are perfect for telling our story. I'm flattered that you would take the time to do that, but I really appreciate that. And we're, we're gonna go full bore. So. Great, we're proud to be here, Don. All thank right. you so thank much. Thank you, you bet. There's more Cattlemen to Cattlemen still ahead, so stay with us. Getting to run a family farm is a dream come true. When you can grow good grass, there's opportunity to grow plenty of weeds. We want to use the tools that will help us do a better job. I would like the legacy to be that we took really good care of the land and we truly did it as a passion and we did our very best for the right reasons. The 90 day trial demo that we did was a great success. We really tried to go after people that hadn't used Altacid before or hadn't used it for several years or had a um, maybe a not so favorable experience with it prior uh, for whatever reason. If we can show you that this will work over 90 days and it doesn't cost you anything, would you be interested in that? Have an upcoming production sale to advertise? Then contact the Cattleman to Cattleman marketing team or your breed association to learn more. Welcome back to our special Ag Day program from right here in Texas. Now, agriculture is more than just a business. For those of us who raise cattle, it's a way of life. We asked the ranchers and cattle industry stakeholders we heard from today to share their thoughts on the value of agriculture. We all have to eat, and I think a domestic supply of food where we can take care of ourselves is critical to a healthy, healthy community, a healthy country. We're a breed of people or a quality of people that has an undetermined amount of work ethic. And, and they work extremely hard in, in the not so best conditions a lot of times to get to get things done, not only to care for the cattle, but to care for the people that are out there doing it. Oh, everybody talks about sustainability. Grass protects this land. It protects our water because it keeps the soil where it is, keeps our water quality clear. The cattle convert this into high quality protein. And there's not any other use for this land that this is safe. And it, it's long-term sustainable. We know that in the United States, most of the land is covered with grass. And those grasslands, those rangelands, they evolved with wild animals. And we're not gonna bring back the wild animals, the fences are up. So we rotate our cattle, we try to mimic what was going on 200, 300 years ago with the wild animals, the bison in this area. We're trying to do that also with cattle and if you were to take all of the cattle off the land, these grasses become really kind of a stoic and uh, they eventually die off. They need the impact of those animals. Hoof action, recycling of those nutrients, manure, urine, all of those things are very, very important. Uh, I like to say if we didn't have the cow, we would be trying to invent her because she's that impactful to the land. We're wrapping up this show with some great images submitted by farming and ranching families from across the country, all of whom are growing a climate for tomorrow.
Now remember, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association fights for the interests of cattle producers in every state and in every sector of the beef cattle industry. But they need your help, so please consider joining me as a member today. Just call 866-233-3872 or you can go to the website ncba.org. Well, that wraps up this special Ag Day edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.